What have you done? Gladiator, please raise your hand if you have a question. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in X-Men 97, Episode 6, Life Death, Part 2. Now, that title is taken from the comic book Life Death, Part 2, where Storm ventures to Africa after she loses her powers. But in the episode, Life Death is actually about two parallel storylines. Both Storm and Xavier are trying to adjust to their new status quos, and they are hindered by fear. But I'll explain the symbolism of these stories as we go along. As always, everybody, I want to thank you for watching our coverage of this show. Last week was a gut punch that frankly I am still processing. I also want to thank you guys for buying our Mon Share tribute shirt from our merch store which helps to support our channel so we can make videos like this one. And we've got some brand new merch that just dropped. We've got Dog S Cyclops, this Polaroid pic of the X-Men's morph and Treasure Planet's morph, and our mutant sitcom shirt featuring the X-Men as friends. Also, during this video, I'm going to have a little bit of help from Colton Ogburn, the guy who is eternally trapped in our TV but doesn't know it, so please don't tell him. Buy this shirt. So, Storm does the previously on. Previously on X-Men. Because this episode is primarily focused on her story about her regaining her powers. Yeah, how did that even work? That was confusing. Well, I'll explain later in the video. We'll get there. I will say, though, that this is inspired by the comics, but I think the show actually did this much better in places. Life, Death, Part 1 and 2 are very famous, groundbreaking X-Men comics from the era where Storm lost her powers. In Part 1, she suffers through grief and falls in love with Forge and learns that he created the weapon that took her powers. But in Part 2, she travels to Africa and hallucinates in a cave and saves an infant from dying. In fact, that scene where she breathes life into a newborn child was already adapted in the original series in the episode Whatever It Takes. But this episode has taken elements of Life Death Part 2 and combined it with the story of Fall of the Mutants. In that crossover, Storm spends several issues being influenced by the adversary who convinces her to kill Forge. Very long story short, she and Forge were whisked away to another dimension where time works differently and they end up spending years together there. Forge is infected with demonic energy but recovers when he's brought back to health by Storm, just like he is in this episode. And this is also when he creates a gun to restore Storm's powers and she also grows out her mohawk. All of which is like lightly adapted in this episode. The opening credits also have a few sad changes. Magneto is missing because he is presumed dead, but he likely survived the attack on Genosha like he does in the comics and I think he's going to return as a villain, also like he does in the comics. And also Nightcrawler has been added in Gambit's place, so he'll now be a permanent member of the team. That is a great choice. I love Nightcrawler. He's a very nuanced character who can play both humor and sadness. His logo here is also the same one from his 1980s comics limited series. Now I have to tell you guys, episode five was like very traumatic for me. Like in my head, I know that Gambit is not a real person, but he's part of my childhood, so he feels real to me. Watching that episode brought back a lot of traumatic experiences from my life. Like I, a few years ago, had a two year span where it seemed like everything in my life was going wrong. I had deaths in the family, a friend committed suicide, I had a breakup. It, it just hit a point where I got real low and had some dark thoughts. And I was tired of burdening my friends and family with all the help that I needed. And that's why I'm telling you that if you were dealing with events like these, therapy can help. Working with a therapist has helped me to understand the core of my anxiety and be a more well-rounded person because therapists can help you understand why you react with anxiety or anger. And that's why I am proud this video is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp makes it easy to connect you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. To start, use our link in the description and answer a few questions so BetterHelp can match you with a professional. You can have your sessions from your phone, computer, phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel most comfortable. You'll be matched to a therapist usually within 48 hours so you can get started fast. So let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can support you all from the comfort of your own home. Visit BetterHelp.com slash ScreenCrush or use the code ScreenCrush during sign up to receive a special discount on your first month. Now back to X-Men. In the opening credits, we see flashes from the original series. We once again see Cable fighting Apocalypse in his temple in Beyond Good and Evil Part 1. Now this story was actually the last time in the original series where Sinister was shown as a villain like in the present day. Like he did briefly return to fight the Phalanx in Season 5's opening, and we saw a flashback of his origin story later that season. Last episode also confirmed that Cable is indeed Scott and Madeline's son from the future, and that his interest in Genosha, which goes all the way back to Season 1 of the original show, he wanted to go to Genosha to prevent this holocaust from happening. I want to say, though, that I really hope this story doesn't end with Cable changing the past and bringing everyone back to life. Gambit's death was a heartbreaker, but it gave the show real stakes, and I hope it sticks. Then we see Master Mold creating Nimrod. Now, Nimrod is a super advanced sentinel from the future that is actually seen in Days of the Future Past. What did you say? Days of the Future Past. It's, it's Days of Future Past. There's no that. <laughs> I think I know how to say it, Doug. I've been reading the comics for years and I even have the cover framed. I'm telling you, you're saying it wrong. You know what? Fine. I'll read the comments, but oh my god. I have been saying that 
wrong for years. I deeply apologize for adding the definitive article to one of the most seminal events in comic history. I'll do better in the future. So anyways, in the episodes Days of Future Past in season one, we do see Bishop and the other people in the future fighting Nimrod. In the comics, Nimrod actually travels back to present day, like the Terminator, and actually disguises itself as a human and learns to be a person. At one point, Nimrod even takes a human form called Bastion, and actually, in Life Death Part 1, we see a photo of Bastion here with Forge. And we actually caught that Easter egg when the episode came out. Yes, and congratulations to us. So, Master Mold creating Nimrod Sentinels is bad news, because these things are like the Borg. They just keep adapting, and they're basically unbeatable. We then see Bishop, Storm, and Wolverine fighting Nimrod, just like they do in the alternate present that we saw in the episode One Man's Work. In that episode, a time traveler named Fitzroy went back in time to kill a teenage Charles Xavier, which makes the present day an apocalyptic nightmare where Storm and Logan fall in love. And we still have this shot of Jean as the Dark Phoenix, making me think that yes, for sure, Phoenix is going to return. This also happens in the comics during the epic Grant Morrison run. In those comics, it's revealed that the Phoenix is always going to be drawn to Jean because of her immense psychic powers. Then we see a shot from the episode Cold Comfort with Polaris helping an injured Havoc while a jealous Iceman looks on. And then the camera pushes into the leader of X-Factor, Forge. And next we see the Shi'ar Imperial Guard fighting the X-Men on the moon. So this is when they sentence Jean to death for losing control of the Phoenix. And then the X-Men had to fight back to save her life in trial by combat. This was all at the end of the Dark Phoenix Saga episodes. And then we see Charles and Lilandra making their first psychic contact, which was from the beginning of the Phoenix Saga. Yeah, what's, what the heck is a Phoenix Saga? Alright, just to give the TLDR here on the Phoenix Saga and the Shi'ar. Lilandra's brother, Dekin, was the Shi'ar Emperor, and he was like full-on insane. He wanted to control this very powerful MacGuffin called the Macron Crystal, so he could become the most powerful being in the universe. And then Jean, as the Phoenix, defeated him. But several episodes later, Jean lost control of the Phoenix Force and destroyed a SAR system, leading the Shi'ar to fight the X-Men on the moon. So, the episode opens with a space battle with the Shi'ar attacking the Kree. The Kree, just like in the MCU, are this galaxy-spanning empire who are always at war with either the Skrulls or the Shi'ar, or sometimes both. Now, we briefly saw the Kree in the original X-Men series. The Kree do not object to this duel. But they were a larger part of the Silver Surfer series, which I believe is part of the same interconnected universe of shows. Deathbird is leading the attack. Now, she is Lalandra's sister, who in the past has allied with Apocalypse to take her sister's throne way back in the episode Beyond Good and Evil Part 2. Apocalypse wanted help kidnapping the Shi'ar telepath Oracle, and he promised Deathbird that he would give her her sister's throne. But... I lied. Since then, it looks like Deathbird is serving her sister and the Empire, but she's lying in wait, waiting to steal the throne for herself. She is defeating Ronan the Accuser, who of course is also in the MCU, but his look here is way more comic accurate. So, Ronan calls her this. Pigeon. Now, it's true, the Shi'ar are an avian race evolved from birds, but this is telling me that there are indeed pigeons in space. They have infiltrated every corner of the galaxy just as they have infiltrated every corner of every city on Earth. Perhaps the mighty pigeon is the true ruler of of the cosmos and we are but their mere pawns. Rise my brothers against this avian plague. Person, that's enough. Sorry. So the members of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard are Gladiator, one of the most powerful beings in the universe whose powers are based on his own belief in himself. There's Manta, Titan, I believe this is Ark, Earthquake, Starbolt, Smasher, and Flashfire. Ronan calls their battle a Pyrrhic victory. So, the term Fearic Victory is from Earth. According to Wikipedia, the phrase originates from a quote from Pyrrhus of Epirius, whose triumph against the Romans in the Battle of Asculum in 279 BC destroyed much of his own forces, forcing the end of his campaign. That's really telling, that Pyrrhus's campaign was such a failure that word of it reached the faraway Shi'ar galaxy. Now, Deathbird is looking for the Supreme Intelligence, the giant head that's filled with all the Kree's interconnected knowledge, that we briefly saw a shot of in the Marvels before Carol killed it. So then we find out that in the show, just like in the comics, Charles and Lalandra are in love and are engaged to be married. This is also taken from the early days of Chris Claremont's run in the X-Men. Charles left for space, leaving Cyclops to run the school. So the show has been acting as if he's dead, but you don't hire the great Ross Marquand, also the Red Skull in the MCU, to come on and do the Professor's voice for just a flashback. We all knew the Professor would be back. I knew it! I knew it! Now, during her speech, we cut to these horse people with pickaxes. Now, these do look like Corbinites, the same species as Beta Ray Bill in the comics. Now, I love how subtle this is. We see these people, and later on, we see the same horse people as gardeners, and, like, we're not really supposed to notice them. But later, when Charles talks about the Shi'ar being colonizers, this is who he's talking about. The colonized people of the Shi'ar were right under our noses the entire time. Charles has become the Queen's consort, even wearing the same armor he wore in the comics. Now, this was actually a big reveal, where we find out that the guy who's been fighting alongside the X-Men for several pages was actually 
actually their leader in disguise. Lalandra does a speed run through past episodes recounting the events of the Dark Phoenix Saga. This man helped spare the entire universe from the madness of my brother Deken as well as the galactic hunger of the phoenix. Now, the professor also wore a Shi'ar exoskeleton in X-Men number 25 that allowed him to walk, just like in this episode. Now, like I said earlier, Ross Marquand is the new voice of Charles Xavier, replacing the retired Cedric Smith. Marquand is a brilliant mimic. I mean, just listen to some of his impressions. No, 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 no. Uh... Damn it. Oh, God. Afterwards, he and Lilandra talk about where they could settle down. On Earth, newlyweds whisk off to some faraway island to celebrate their love. Now, it's funny that what Lilandra is describing is basically how Scott and Jean spent their honeymoon in Season 2, until they were attacked by Sinister. Also, that could also be the event when Jean was swapped out with the clone Madeline. I think it's interesting that Scott and Jean's honeymoon was cut short by Sinister, and Charles and Lilandra's marriage is going to be cut short by Sinister's attack on Genosha. Charles can walk with the aid of an exoskeleton, and in the comics, the Shi'ar actually create a new clone body for him. Now, now, I thought this was a very brilliant scene because we see that Lalandra immediately understands why Charles has not told the X-Men he's alive. He feels guilty for not returning home, for choosing his own happiness over his dream. And then we go back to Forge's cabin where the adversary is getting into Storm's head. Oh, and real quick, here's something I missed in the first Life Death episode. The Channel New Rockstars pointed out that Storm sees this owl flying against the wind. That owl, I've seen him before circling. The winds here never shift. They always blow east stuck like this owl. Basically, it's in defiance of nature, and this is the same owl that later reveals that it's the adversary. Great catch. So the adversary in the comics was summoned to Earth when Forge made a prayer to the demon during Vietnam. Here, it serves a similar narrative purpose. It's an ancient demon who feeds on fear. Yummy! Throughout the episode, it makes Storm face her fears, which helps her to regain her powers. But I'll explain how a little bit later and talk about how this syncs up perfectly with Charles's lesson to the Shi'ar. I will say, though, that her conversation with the adversary is similar to her conversation with the venomous snake in the cave in the comic book Life Death Part 2. These are both animals that force her to confront her worst fear about losing her powers, that she's actually better off being a normal human. The adversary locks her in a coffin, reminding us of her greatest fear, claustrophobia. And that fear is also an extension of what she's going through right now. Without her powers, Storm feels cut off from the world, like she is trapped in a box and she can't feel the wind. Now, the adversary uses Storm words against her. As you said to Jean, I have wondered what it would be like to be human. Which is from episode two. I have wondered what it would be like to be human. The X-Men are superheroes who protect the people that hate and fear them. So of course, Storm wonders if she could be happier as a normal person. Charles goes through the same feelings. Instead of leading a fruitless battle for equality, he can enjoy the comforts of helping to rule over an entire galaxy. And then she sees different members of the team, just like how she hallucinates the X-Men in the cave during the comic book Life Death Part Two. Right here, we see a glimpse of Forge's X-Factor uniform before he runs on to cast a spell. And notice how the spells are drawn to look just like how magic is cast in the MCU. This is a super cool detail. Remember, we saw the Watcher over Genosha last episode, confirming that X-Men 97 takes place in the main Marvel multiverse. And since magic draws its power from other dimensions, it makes sense that it would look the same in all the universes of the MCU. Because no matter what universe you're in, all the sorcerers are drawing their magic from the same dimension. Back in space, Deathbird challenges Charles' ascension to Queen Consort, saying that he is from the wrong side of the stars, which is like saying from the wrong side of the tracks. She also calls him a Terran, the same name that space people call Earth in the MCU. I'm not Terran. So Deathbird forces Charles agree to pay the ultimate price, to not only purge his memories of Earth, but also of the X-Men. This is also paralleling Storm's story. She chose to leave the X-Men behind to start a new life, turning her back on the struggle for mutant rights so she could live as an ordinary human. Gladiator and Charles talk about the myth of their highest gods. The union of Shara and Keithri is at the core of our principles, to bind various cultures into one for the sake of galactic peace and harmony. To which Charles says, How Rudyard Kipling of you. Now Charles goes on to call Kipling, One possessed of many burdens, none real. Kipling was the English author and poet who famously wrote colonial literature. Some adaptations of his works, like The Jungle Book, are still beloved. But then, he also wrote the poem The White Man's Burden, which essentially said that it was the duty of white men to spread across the world and bring their form of civilization to cultures like India. Charles is saying here that the Shi'ar are doing the same thing. They conquer planets, and then they force these planets to incorporate themselves into Shi'ar culture. The quality of life on the planets may improve, better health care, clean water, protection from the Kree, but the people on those planets lose their individuality 
equality and freedom. This is also paralleled later by Storm and Forge's journey to Snow Snake Tower. Now, this butte is also reminiscent of the mountain they lived on during the fall of the mutants when Forge was able to create a device that restored Storm's powers. Forge tells us that it was actually built during the Plains War decades earlier by colonists. So Storm points out that these same colonizers eradicated Forge's tribe. Now, there is an important parallel here between the slaughter of the Plains Native Americans and the Genosian Holocaust. This episode shows us how the fictional events of Genosha are actually a reflection of the real life history of the world. There was colonization in the time of Kipling and even here in the United States. And remember, Forge said, I always heard how the worst weapon used by the Europeans was not bullets or blankets. But a white lie. He's cut off there, but the lie he's talking about is the lie of normalcy. Colonizers like Kipling or the Shi'ar go places and tell the natives, if you just be like us, you won't need to be afraid anymore. This is when Storm tells Forge something that is essential in any story, the lie the character believes. She says that her powers only inspire hatred in mankind, so it's better that she is normal. She has been taught that it's easier to conform. And out in space, Charles is faced with this same decision. He can leave behind his past, his memory, his dream to become uniform with the rest of the Shi'ar, but he can't bring himself to forget his family, his children. My X-Men. All the while, Deathbird shows us that she is just as racist as humans. Have our blood mixed with his inferior freak fluids. So this begins to kick off a Shi'ar civil war. Charles comes to this realization. I have forgotten my greatest gift. But the cool thing here is that Charles doesn't mean that he's not using his mutant powers to control people's minds. His greatest gift is not telepathy, it's being a teacher. So he brings the Shi'ar into a classroom on the astral plane, the same dimension where Doctor Strange communicates with the Ancient One at the end of Doctor Strange, and where Charles and Jean battle the Shadow King in the the episode Xavier remembers. He's no longer wearing his Shi'ar armor and instead his classic suit and tie from the original series. In other words, he is returning to who he really is, and he's casting aside the image of who the Shi'ar want him to be. Meanwhile, Storm is wearing these same overalls that she wore in the comic book Life Death Part 1, and she has to confront her greatest physical and emotional fears. Her greatest physical fear is her claustrophobia, fear of tight spaces. But her greatest emotional fear is that she's better off without her powers, that mutants should simply allow themselves to be colonized by humans and blend in. So, when the adversary forces her to confront her fears, it's actually freeing her. Executioner's neutralizer was not the only weapon tamping down my gifts. There was that lie. So the adversary is a bad guy, but it gave Storm back her powers? That makes no sense. Well, that's not what happened. Forge's machine in episode four actually worked, but Storm still couldn't access her powers because she was afraid to. She was afraid that she was better off as a normal person who didn't have to constantly suppress her emotions. But the adversary's magic does transform Storm somewhat. I mean, she gets her original costume from Giant Size X-Men number one, and her mohawk is suddenly gone, replaced with long flowing hair. We finally heal our adversary by embracing it. Personally, I think she got her powers back a little too soon, and I would have liked to have seen her rejoin the X-Men with no powers for a few episodes, because like that really made for some great stories in the comics, but really, I'm nitpicking a pretty great episode here. Afterwards, Storm turns on the TV and sees news of the massacre in Genosha. The reporter here is Trish Tilby, who also interviewed the X-Men last episode, and she's also Beast girlfriend in the comics. Now, last week I did say that the Genosha massacre was from the comics, but I failed to point out that it was visually taken directly from the Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly comic, E for Extinction. The image of the island and the insectoid sentinel are direct recreations of Frank Quietly's artwork. So Xavier and Storm are learning the same lessons here, to embrace their gifts and to not be afraid of the consequences. But in Charles's case, it's his gift as a teacher. Earlier in the episode, when Gladiator espoused the Shi'ar racist philosophy, Charles didn't challenge his worldview. But now he's ready to burn the entire Shi'ar system to the ground. We even get this fun callback. Demerits, raise your hand. <laughs> to Scott's memories of the professor back in episode one. Uh, the professor would shout, your childish hijinks have cost you five demerits, young man. So back on Earth, the news speculates, As rumors swirl, <gasps> that Genosha is the opening salvo in the long-feared evolutionary war as the shot fades to a globe of Earth on Charles's astral desk. So I think this episode is setting up that Charles will return to Earth to prevent this evolutionary war the way he is about to prevent a civil war among the Shi'ar. He points out that the Shi'ar are a colonizing force, which like I said, is a truth that's been lurking in the background all through the episode with shots of other races like the horse people who are Shi'ar servants. And then he gives this lovely speech about how life is fleeting, but the universe is forever and we are all made from stardust. Your existence is messy that the universe is very old, and all of us very young, born of ancient stardust. 
This is such a beautiful play on words because the X-Men and all mutants are called the children of the Adam. But in just a few words, Charles is able to speak to what unites humans and mutants. We're all living on the same small wet rock surrounded by infinite death in all directions. From a cosmic scale, all of our differences seem pretty petty. And how much blood has been spilled by rulers wanting to rule a fraction of this pale blue dot. Exactly. But then this lovely sentiment is undercut by a psychic vision of the Genosha massacre. This is similar to the vision that Madeline received in episode one. She saw the graves of mutants and then saw a time vortex with Cable's voice. Also, another shout out to new rock stars, they caught that the song in that vision is the Ace of Base song Happy Nation that we hear in episode 5. I'm still not okay. The vision begins with seeing the Shi'ar become corpses, but more to the point, Charles sees corpses in student desks, telling him that his mutant children are dying. Then Gambit appears with a fiery X behind him as he transforms into Master Mold. And then Charles feels his own flesh burned from his body, a way of showing that he was in the minds of the mutants who were massacred on Genosha, or as Obi-Wan put it, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. So both Storm and Xavier have found love in a perfect little haven where they can live with their new lovers. And these idyllic lives are taken from them by the massacre in Genosha. Xavier says goodbye to Lalandra, calling their life a star-crossed love affair, which of course is paraphrased from Romeo and Juliet. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. He says, It is time I return to my X-Men. And this affectionate moniker, My X-Men, has been used since the final panel of X-Men number one. And it's also the last thing he said to them before leaving the team. Proud of you all, my X-Men. And then we get this epilogue where we learn who is behind the Sentinel attack. First, we see Bolivar Trask, the creator of Master Mold and the Sentinels running away. I did what you asked. I gave you my DNA to access Master Mold. And actually behind Trask there, we can see a banner for War of the Worlds. So Sinister using the Trask DNA to control the Sentinels was actually taken from the Grant Morrison comics. Xavier's twin sister, Cassandra, used the DNA of Bolivar's cousin, Donald Trask, to send the Sentinels to eradicate Genosha. And it turns out that, no surprise, Sinister was behind everything. Sinister wants to create a pure mutant bloodline and to control that bloodline for himself. So it makes sense that he would want to start an evolutionary war, a war that humans will surely lose, and then he can control the pieces. He also wiped out the ruling council of Genosha, creating a mutant power vacuum that now he can fill. But let's not forget that Sinister also bred Madeline and Scott to create a genetically perfect offspring. Cable. Cable has been trying to prevent the Genosha massacre from happening. Maybe he was trying to prevent this because it's this massacre that allows Sinister to reshape the world. Guys, overall, this series is just amazing. I, I mean, I can nitpick about a few things like speed running through Storm and Madeline's stories, but this is by far the best interpretation of the X-Men that I've ever seen outside the comics. And showrunner Bo DeMaio even hinted that episode 8 is even more brutal, so I'm not sure if I'm ready for what's about to come. But let me know your thoughts and theories about X-Men 97 down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.